Uh, my name is Austin, uh, and I'm the student minister here at The Crossing. And I'm going to let you know up front, I'm not capable of matching Brian's energy, nor am I going to try to. Uh, <laughs> what a great time of worship to set us up this morning. I love Christmas music. And I'm the type of person who listens to Christmas music when you're supposed to listen to Christmas music, meaning November 1st, right? The, the second that Halloween is over, it's Christmas season in my household. Brayden, uh, this camera op back here, thinks differently, but I think Brayden's wrong. <laughs> There's something about Christmas music that I find really cozy and really nostalgic. I love listening to all of the classics, Dean Martin, Bing, Bing Crosby, Nat King Cole. I like listening to some of the newer stuff. Kelly Clarkson, Taylor Swift, Ben Rector. And I'm not too proud to admit that whenever I hear Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You, I will sing out. <laughs> Didn't say it would be good, but I will sing. Silent Night, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Joy to the World by Candlelight on Christmas Eve. I mean, come on. It doesn't get much better than that. My all-time favorite Christmas song from pretty much the time I was 10 or 11 has always been Oh Holy Night, which makes me really excited for our Christmas series, A Thrill of Hope. Uh, each week in this series, we're going to take a phrase, a lyric from that song, and we're going to teach on it. And I'll give you a little bit of, uh, I'll give you a little tip. There are some really good weeks coming. So make sure that you're here all month. The phrase that I want to focus on this morning is a weary world rejoices. That's something we can relate to, right? I heard some, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> we feel weary all the time, but especially at this time of year. We take our normal life, our normal rhythm, our normal routine, and then we add on things like Christmas shopping, and we add on travel, and we add on time with extended family. If you're in high school or college, you add on exams, and some of us are going through holidays for the first time without loved ones. And just talking about that is making me feel exhausted. And so that's what this song is referring to, right? We get a little bit of, uh, we get a a little weary around Christmas time, and then someone reminds us, hey, Jesus is the reason for the season. And wouldn't you know, that solves everything, right? That's why a weary world can rejoice. I think it's a little deeper than that. And so if that's the case, then we have some work to do to figure out what it's actually saying. I want to start by asking a question. What is making the world so weary? There's no shortage of things that might make us weary, but there's one thing that makes me weary in a way unlike anything else, waiting. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. I hate going to the DMV, right? At the Georgetown DMV, I have yet to go there for less than an hour. I'm there. I know I'm going to be there an hour. Sometimes it might be two, but I hate going to the DMV. I also hate long lines in drive through restaurants. If I pull into a restaurant and the line is wrapped around the building, guess what? I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. doesn't matter how hungry I am. doesn't matter how much I've been craving that food. If the line is long, I'm out of here. I do the same thing at the grocery store. This is this is when you might start to think that I'm a little crazy. Uh, I, I've put all of my food in my shopping cart, and I get to the checkout line, and I start scanning each individual line. To, I hear some of you laughing. It's because you do it too. I, ch I scan each line to see uh, which one has the fewest people, and then, then I start to look at how many items each person has in their cart because I'm trying to get out of the grocery as fast as possible. The most excruciating waiting that I've experienced in my life is when we found out that we were pregnant with Knox. We waited to tell uh, our students. We waited to tell our church family. Uh, and then we waited to find out if he was a boy or a girl. Surprise, he's a boy. Uh, 
And then after we found out he was a boy, we named him, and then we had to wait another five months until we met him. We waited, and we waited, and we waited. I'm sure that you can relate to that on some level. We hate waiting, but waiting is a part of life. And sometimes we're waiting on things that are much more important than the DMV and the grocery store checkout line. Sometimes we wait on test results to see if the cancer has come back. We wait on fertility results to see why it's been so difficult to add to our families. We wait for that romantic relationship that we've so long desired. We wait to hear back about the new job or the big promotion at work. Some of us wait for the next paycheck so that we can buy groceries. See, for a long time, humanity has been in a waiting pattern. They've been waiting for things to get better, and it's, it's just part of their story. Our Bible tells us the story of God and his people. And so the scriptures, uh, the stories that we read in scripture are all a part of one giant narrative that God is writing himself. And so they're not just nice, cute little stories. They're all a part of one connected story, and that story is our story. So our story has been one of waiting. But it wasn't always like that. God's people once lived in a garden with the creator of the universe without the stress of any time restraints. That sounds pretty good to me. But then came the fall, and God's people decided to choose for themselves what was best, despite the advice of a loving God. And so since then, God's people have been waiting for their situation to improve. And God has been there every step of the way, promising that he will be faithful to his people and telling them, hey, things will get better. We often expect instant results, right? Uh, but we know God's timing often works a bit different. And so we, he we hear things are going to get better, and we expect it instantly. But then we wait. In the book of Genesis, just a few moments after Adam and Eve has sin have sinned, uh, God appears to Eve, and, and God gives her good news, he says, there will come an offspring from your family that will crush the head of the serpent that just deceived you. And they waited. Later on in Genesis, we're introduced to a righteous man named Abraham. And Abraham is so obedient to God that God wants to enter into a covenant relationship with him. He says, Abraham, you're so obedient, I want to bless you, and so I will make your descendants outnumber the stars in the sky. We know that that type of family expansion doesn't happen overnight. And so they waited. Eventually, God's people, at this point, now a, a, a nation in their own right, find themselves as slaves in the foreign land of Egypt. And they cry out to God over and over again for deliverance. And they waited. God heard them. And he brought them out of Egypt, and he set aside this promised land for them, but it was going to take a little bit to get there. And so they waited. And that led them to a period of judges. God would raise up a judge who would lead his people back to himself. And it would work for a while, but then God's people would get antsy, and they would get irritated, and they would return to their, own, their old ways. And they would experience even more hardship, and they would cry out to God. And they eventually started to cry out to God, God, would you give us a king? We want to be like these other nations. Would you give us a king? And they waited. Eventually, God does give them a king. It's a man named Saul, and he's a mess. And Saul's shortcomings point to the fact, hey, we need a new king. And so they wait. And then David enters the picture, and, and David is still far from perfect, but Scripture tells us that David is a man after God's own heart. 
and God sees it, and he wants to make another covenant with David. God says, David, I want to be with my people. Will you build me a temple? Will you build me a tabernacle so that my presence can be around my people? He says, David, if you do this, I will raise up a king from your family line, and his throne will last forever. I will be like a father to him. My love will never depart from him. And so David does what God asks him, and then he waited. Israel goes through a really rough period after that, where they experience countless manipulative and evil kings. And they are longing for the days of this good king that God has promised. And they, they let God know, God, where is this king that you've promised us? And they waited. While they waited, they are hauled off into captivity in foreign lands. And while they're in these foreign lands, there are prophets that rise up among them. And, and their, perp, their job is twofold. They are, getting people's, uh, they are getting God's people to remember the ways that God had fulfilled promises in the past. And they're pointing to a time in the future when things will be better. The prophets say things like this. Ezekiel talks about a coming shepherd. Isaiah talks about a young virgin woman who will give birth to a man who is a sign from the Lord. This man, as Isaiah says, he is going to be a cornerstone for many, and Isaiah even lets us know his hometown of Galilee. Isaiah says that this man will perform many signs and miracles. He will be preceded by someone who will pave the way for him. But ultimately, this man will be both despised and rejected. The prophet Daniel talks about the coming son of man whose throne will last forever. And all people will worship him because he holds all authority, power, and honor. Micah says that this king will be born in Bethlehem, and Jeremiah says that this king will come and establish a new covenant with God's people. The prophets come, and they go, and they bring hope to God's people while they're there, but God's people continue to wait. After the prophets... God's people don't hear from him for over 400 years. For 400 years, they wait, and they wait, and they wait. All throughout this age of waiting, the Psalms provide us a really unique insight into the hearts and minds of God's people while they wait. I love the way that Psalm 40, verse 1 puts it. I patiently waited on the Lord. Now, the word that's used for waited there in the Hebrew is actually repeated twice in a row. And we translate that as, I patiently waited. But the psalmist is essentially saying, I waited, waited. I really waited. I waited for a long time. And it's true. God's people waited for a long time for things to get better. Here's what I've noticed about waiting. The longer we wait, the more weary we become. When we first start to wait for something, it's easy. But then as time goes on, we lose patience. Right? Like if we're setting out on a road trip, the first hour isn't bad. But the longer that the road trip goes on, the more irritated we get. And it's in those moments that we all revert back to the little kid in the back of our parents' vehicle. Are we there yet? (laughs) So where's the good news? What turns our waiting and our weariness into rejoicing? There's a man who shows up. He's from a small town called Galilee. His name is Jesus. And when he shows up, he starts doing and saying some pretty interesting things. We know he's from the line of David and Abraham and Adam. He's born in the town of Bethlehem by a young virgin mother. He's preceded by 
uh, a man who paves the way for him, a man named John. He's a teacher. He performs many signs and miracles. He refers to himself both as a shepherd and a cornerstone. When he shows up, he establishes a new covenant with his people. Oh, and at his baptism, there's a voice that comes down from heaven that says, this is my son. You see it, right? In the Old Testament, there are 57 times where God's people are, are told, hey, there's this guy who's coming, who's going to save you. And when he shows up, this is what he's going to be like. And then Jesus shows up and he starts doing and proclaiming all of these things. And so these words of hope that God's people have clung on to for generations are playing out in front of their own eyes. And that is why they rejoice. If I were in their shoes, I would be freaking out. I would be setting off alarms. I'd be running around like the scene in the office just screaming, it's happening, it's happening. The thing that we've been waiting for for hundreds of years is finally here. They rejoice because their waiting is over. God has remembered his people. He has kept his promises. And this is just the beginning of the plan. Jesus came. He lived. He died. He rose again. And we know he went back to heaven. And right before he goes back to heaven, he says, hey, guys, I'll, I'll be right back. And that was 2,000 years ago. And so now you and I, we are the ones waiting and waiting and waiting. So I have a question for you. Do you feel weary? I think all of us feel weary at some point. Moments and seasons of life when it feels like we're being attacked on all sides and we're just waiting for things to get better. We're waiting on our situation to improve. We're waiting for the storm to pass and we wait and we wait and we wait. And yeah, we can celebrate the eternal landscape of things, but it's easy to get distracted by the immediate trials that we're facing. Sometimes we don't feel like rejoicing because life is just too hard right now. And so what do we do in the meantime? What do we do while we wait? I think scripture gives us two great pieces of advice for how we ought to live in the waiting. Scripture tells us to remember and rejoice. Remember. Remember is one of the most common commands in all of scripture. We are commanded to remember over 250 times. It's in these moments that we're being told to look back on our own lives and acknowledge the moments where God has shown up and been there for us. When the Israelites are complaining in the desert, Moses is constantly telling them, hey, the, the same God that you're complaining to right now is the same one who brought you out of Egypt in the first place. And he calls them to remember. Scripture has given us the remedy. Remember. So think back on a moment when God showed up for you. He was there for you then. And I trust that he'll be there for you again. When we're stuck in these moments of waiting for things to get better, I want you to stop and think and ask yourself this question. When is the time that I can look back on my own life and see that God was there for me? Uh, mine is pretty, uh, I, I have one that I always run back to. When I was in high school, my family was in the process of adopting uh, and we, uh, my brother Titus, his due date was October 1st, 2013. Uh, in July of 2013, we got a phone call. There was a complication with the birth mother, and we lost my brother Titus. And uh, we were devastated, and much like the Israelites, much like God's people, uh, I felt alone. I felt abandoned. I felt weary. But if we fast forward to September of 2013, 
We got another phone call uh, about a baby who was born right down the road from our house, uh, and baby needed a family. And so my family stepped in and adopted my brother, Max. Wouldn't you know, we brought Max home on October 1st, 2013. Whenever I find myself stuck in this rut of weariness, I try to remember that situation. God was there for me then, and I trust him to do it again. I think Psalm 77 paints a really beautiful image of remembering. It's written by uh, the psalmist Asaph, and he writes this psalm at a time of trouble in his own life, a moment when he feels weary. And as he starts to spiral out of control mentally, he catches himself, and he says this, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. The cure to our waiting And our weariness is to remember what God has done for us. Because it's difficult to stay stuck in the pit when we're remembering the goodness of God. The second piece of advice that scripture gives us is it it tells us to rejoice. And this one shouldn't catch you off guard. Because the lyric to the song is, a weary world rejoices. And so how should we live in in the waiting? Rejoicing. And we have a lot to rejoice about. Jesus is here, the king has come, the wait is over, and uh, we can rejoice because we know how the story is going to end. Jesus' arrival is the fulfillment of all of these promises that God has made to his people, and and the promises make one thing very clear. The, The things that we face in this world do not have the final word. Jesus does. And so like the scriptures say, let's rejoice. Let's join in with everyone who has gone before us and let's worship as as one world who's been invigorated by the arrival of our Savior. Psalm 34 verse 1 puts it this way. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Our rejoicing is what helps sustain us during these tough periods. God has shown up. He has been there for us. And so he's worthy of our praise and rejoicing. Our waiting doesn't have to keep us down. It can energize us as we wait for Jesus' return with an eager expectation. And so I want to circle back to the beginning. Why does a weary world rejoice? A weary world can rejoice because Jesus has come to earth. God has fulfilled his promises to generation after generation, and he remembered his people. Simply put, the Savior has come, and the wait is over. Hope is here. And that's what we celebrate at at Christmas. We celebrate the arrival of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And this baby lying in the manger is the fulfillment of God's promises to his people who have waited and waited and waited. The weary world has a reason to rejoice. But in the meantime, you and I will still encounter momentary weariness as we wait on Jesus' return. You and I are still living in the waiting. But if we remember what God has done for us and we rejoice in the waiting, the waiting doesn't win. Would you pray with me? God, you are so good to us. You are a God who is faithful. You are a God who keeps his promises. You are a God. And so, God, we, we pray that 
uh, as we wait on you, that we would remember what you've done, and we would praise you for the things you've done. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.